So we are in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a fascinating prophet for us to be in. Those of you that know me over the years know that I have a tendency to what some people would call mysticism or the cabal or the, you know, those kinds of things. Well, Ezekiel, in addition to being a prophet, was a trained for the priesthood and uh, as such was uh, deeply, deeply committed to a study of the, the uh, subtler aspects of, the, of Judaism and the temple rites and uh, God's dealing with his nation. So as he, as he is called to prophetic office, he brings to it a background and insight that's uh, unique. And uh, we talked about the man last time, so I won't go through all that again, but I think we're going to find him interesting in many ways, one of which is, is that God has called him uh, to, uh, incidentally, one of the things we're going to discover tonight is that he's called him to a, um, what you and I would call a failure. You know, uh, we're all amused by Jonah. You know, that uh, Jonah was called to Nineveh. He didn't want to go in the first place. And God had to do that whole, uh, you know, fish thing or whale thing, whatever, uh, to get him to go. And he finally went. And he hated him. And he went through unenthusiastically, you know. And uh, then to really cap off his misery, Nineveh was converted. And that really put Jonah in a pout. And it's interesting, too, that in other cases we have uh, places where at least there's some prospect of, of uh, success. But, but God makes it quite clear to Ezekiel, and, and we'll see that tonight as we're going to go a little further into his call, that God knows right up front that uh, he's given uh, Ezekiel a pretty tough task. Uh, you would think that the nation, which has gone into captivity, would um, be sensitive to God's dealing with them. But quite the contrary, their hearts are hardened, and that Ezekiel is sent on a pretty tough assignment, and uh, God points it right out, you know, points it up front. I remember Moses, when he was called, you know, God indicated to Moses that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. It was only, and, 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 and that was to show God strong. It was staged to, so that God could show his strength. And it was only an extremist that they finally would yield and so forth. And, and if you recall our study in Exodus, that's, that's all point out to Moses up front. Ezekiel, likewise. Last time we took uh, chapters 1 and 2, right? Did we take two chapters last time? I thought we, yeah, we broke a 10-year you know, tradition. We actually took two chapters one night, and, uh, which took this awesome, awesome spectacle that uh, Ezekiel was uh, uh, witnessed where he got a glimpse of uh, the throne of God itself. The cherubim, uh, the strange, strange vision that uh, had such an impact on his life. And then we got to uh, chapter 2, which was, you know, a short chapter, but uh, where he uh, indeed uh, is called to his prophetic office. And then we, we closed on uh, this business of uh, eating the word. If you recall, um, he's given the scroll that's written within and without and told to eat it. And we're reminded of Jeremiah's. Similar words, that words were found, and I did eat them, Jeremiah says. We last time took a quick look at uh, Revelation 10, where John has a similar experience. Again, where the words are sweet in his mouth, but bitter to his belly. In other words, superficially, the first reaction is one of pleasant prophecy. You see the new things coming, isn't that exciting? But then as you really absorb the kind of judgments that God was dealing with, uh, it's a pretty, pretty heavy, uh, heavy experience. And uh, so we looked at some other examples. This idiom of eating his word is one that is not unusual to the uh, biblical scholar. It's one that's perhaps uh, uh, descriptive for ourselves. How easy it is to, uh, to expose yourself to the word of God as a head trip, to learn all the fancy words, do a little library study, and have little hobby horses. You know, we all have our own little pet things that we know pretty well because we've dug into them. But it's a head trip. And how different it is is if we really ingest, digest, absorb that word so it gets right down in the groin, right in the guts, and really becomes part of your life, part of your being. That's uh, a choice of idiom by the Holy Spirit here. I don't think it's obviously not accidental. But that's where we close in chapter 2. Chapter 3 really continues on with that same uh, issue, and we're going to be dealing here with Ezekiel's call and his charge, his, his marching orders. On the one hand, they're pretty straightforward. On the other hand, I think they'll be instructive to you and I in, in a couple of different ways. So let's uh, jump into chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, Ezekiel speaking, he said unto me, Son of man, now there again is that ben Adem, the, uh, the uh, uh, just son of the dust. It's just, uh, it's not to be confused with a title as it's used elsewhere in the scripture. It's really just an expression that uh, is used of Ezekiel to uh, speak of his frailty. Son of the dust, or son of man. 
said unto me, Son of man, eat what thou findest, eat this scroll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said unto me, Son of man, eat and fill thy stomach with this scroll uh, that I give thee. And then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go and get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech or of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Now, those are pretty heavy words. Uh, this is what God is saying to, uh, to Ezekiel. You're going to, I'm sending you to your own people. If I sent you to Africa or uh, New Guinea or India or someplace, and either through hard work or a gift of the Spirit or whatever gave you the language, no problem, they would have heard you. But I'm going to do worse. I'm going to send you to your own people. It's interesting that uh, what he's saying here is if the language was difficult and so forth, something you might have words that would be difficult to pronounce and all that sort of thing, those kinds of impediments, that um, uh, that would not be a problem. From here, of course, you, if we want to take the time, I've got some other things I want to focus on tonight, but if you want to take the time, you could easily compare this with uh, the kind of remarks that some of the other prophets uh, made when God called them. Example, Moses. Remember, he said, I'm of slow speech. And, uh, uh, stuttering. He, was, he had a stutter. So, you know, he gave him Aaron as a spokesman. But the point is, is that uh, God said, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And, and, and Moses didn't seem to uh, have a very, he, he had uh, a certainly a very effective ministry. But in this case, Ezekiel is being called to Israel, his own people. But it's also interesting to me uh, that, he, it's, it, that um, God tells him right up front that they're not going to hear you. Why aren't they going to hear you? Because they wouldn't hear me. And that sort of begs a question, then why bother? And we're going to see it, a glimpse of that here, too. Uh, obviously, some of them will, and for the, the remnant that does, that's valuable. But we're going to also uh, uh, we're going to see that Ezekiel, while he is sent to the house of Israel, so that God might be just when he judges, he'll also discover, in about chapter 33, Ezekiel's message shifts. When Jerusalem finally falls, and they find his, his prophesying to the nation that, bear in mind, uh, Somewhere, either now or maybe at the end of this chapter, we should recount the details. And maybe I should do that right now. I'll do it at the end of the chapter. I won't break my stride. I want to recount. Bear in mind, Ezekiel is with, in the second deportation. He is with the captives in Babylon. But Jerusalem is still back there, a vassal city, but destined to fall. And so as long as Jerusalem hasn't fallen, Ezekiel's message, and it will be this way for quite a few chapters, will be to his people admonishing them to flee idolatry and to, uh, to return to the Lord. They won't do that. And as a result, God will judge them and, just, and level Jerusalem, bring them all into captivity. And at that point, Ezekiel's message shifts. That's also where our attention will pick up, because from chapter 34 on, it will blow us away as to what Ezekiel's talking about. He will talk about 1948 and 1967 and perhaps 1985 or 6 or whatever. And, I mean, it's really going to get contemporary very quickly. So why was Ezekiel called? Yes, first to the house of Israel, then where? To you and I. Because that's one reason we gather here on a hot Monday night, to dig in this book, because we somehow get an instinct that this is more than just biblical background. It has something to say to you and I today. But at this point, let me, let me continue with his call. The impudent hard-hearted, verse 7. Verse 8, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. In other words... I've made you just as hard-headed as they are, okay? Now, you're going to get some clues here because God is going to warn Ezekiel about the abuse he's going to take from his people. You know, it's good for us to visualize his colorful character, as you as we will find him to be, doing all these strange things that God's asked Ezekiel to do as a form of witness. But uh, we should also be sensitive to the fact that this is pretty tough on Ezekiel because his own people were really, um, they did not receive him. He obviously took a lot of abuse, but God apparently prepared him for that, made him obstinate, tough, hard-headed, stiff-necked himself. That's what he's saying here. 
I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. And he says, like an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy forehead fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Now, where God has to warn Ezekiel about that, you should recognize that that, was, that prophecy probably came true. In other words, they really gave him nasty looks and so forth. Now, there's one small point that I happen to pick up along the way here. The word adamant is a, you know, we use the term rhetorically. Someone's adamant. But it really comes from a, a precious stone that's very hard. Like flint, that's why he says, I have made thee like an adamant harder than flint. In other words, the word adamant actually classically means something very, very hard. Interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, the word is samir, which also means the thorn bush of the desert. And so those of us that remember the study in Exodus 4, the burning bush, which was a thorn bush of the desert, as a model of sin, and that same thorn being the thorn that Christ wore in his crown, you can make a whole study of that. For those of you that are on that kind of a kick, I happen to notice that uh, verse 9 uses the, the word Samir in Hebrew. So I'll oh, move on. That's a footnote, no extra charge for that. Uh, okay. Uh, verse 10, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all, thy, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears, and go, get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Now, what, he, what God is saying is, you're going to speak with my voice. This business of standing up before a group saying, thus saith the Lord, was not a figure of speech. That exposed him to the death penalty if he was wrong. The concept of blasphemy in Israel was a capital crime. So if you went around expressing rabbinical interpretations on something, fine. But if you stand up as a prophet and say, Thus saith the Lord God, that was a phrase that they took very seriously. And, and Ezekiel is here instructed so to present uh, God's uh, instruction. Uh, but then we get to verse 12. As a charismatics, we're heartened by verse 12. And then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from, this, from his uh, place. The great rushing probably immediately reminds you of Acts chapter 2 and so forth, but we'll keep moving on here. Verse 13, I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels beside them and the noise of a great rushing. That's another phrase, by the way, that causes me to believe that the vision that uh, Ezekiel saw was not allegorical. It was somehow his attempt to describe in conceptions of 2,500 years ago of what he saw when he was confronted with this strange presence. I suppose today, if we described it, we'd use terms like hyperspace and such. Uh, our imaginations are perhaps a little broader than, than Ezekiel's pen might have been, having the benefit of George Lucas and other guys. But in any case, uh, be that as it may, uh, we are certainly from verse 13 and others, draw the inference that what we saw in chapter 1 was not just a hallucination. It was a, an opportunity to perceive into that dimension that uh, these other creatures uh, operated. But in any case, verse 14, So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in, uh, in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me, and I came unto them of the captivity, believe it or not, at Tel Aviv. Okay, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, the B and the V is uh, in the Semitic language is equivalent. This is not the Tel Aviv that uh, we all know, which is on the coast. But apparently there was a settlement by the river Chebar that the captives were at that was known as Tel Aviv. So that's where he uh, comes to dwell. And then I came to them at the, uh, of the captivity of Tel Aviv and dwelt by the river Chebar, and I sat there uh, where they sat and remained there overwhelmed among them seven days. Now this is that passage in which the whole experience of seeing chapter 1 and the Lord talking to him all through chapter 2 and 3 has left Ezekiel overwhelmed. He was physically overwhelmed. How long? Seven days. Why seven days? One suggestion. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 33, appoints the period of a consecration of a priest as being seven days. Is that, the re is that significant? Don't know, but he was a priest. He is being consecrated. Uh, the seven days uh, seems, seems to be consistent with God's pattern. In any case, he's overwhelmed for seven days. In verse 16, it came to pass at the end of the seven days, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And now we have four verses that are very famous in the book of Ezekiel, the so-called watchman challenge. 
This is where Ezekiel is called to be a watchman. And, uh, you know, we're very fond of reading the Pauline epistles in the New Testament and getting certain admonitions to witness or be a witness and all that sort of thing. Um, somehow, Ezekiel's calling seems to me crisper. And uh, there's probably will be debate among you as to whether we are in the same position as Ezekiel. I'm not going to even jump into that one. I'll leave that up to you to think yourselves. But I want you to put yourself, as we read this passage, in the position of Ezekiel being called to be a witness. And notice what God says to Ezekiel, starting verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Oh, really? That's heavy. Boy, do we want to find some passage out of the New Testament to take us off the hook of that one, right? This is the age of grace, and, and you know, gee, uh, Galatians come to my rescue, or maybe Ephesians somewhere, help me. Certainly that doesn't apply to you and I. Well, I think it does. Verse 19, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now the word soul here is a different term than in the New Testament, so I'm not going to make a big thing of that. But his, your being, you've delivered your, your, yourself, in other words. Verse 20, Again, when the righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall live because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, when he's speaking of righteous man here, he's not thinking of someone that's justified by faith. He's talking about someone who under the righteousness of Moses, that is conforming at least to... Uh, to some level, uh, to the to the law. So there's a whole issue here. We could spend all evening talking about the law and grace, and the you know the whole uh, uh, situation of the Old Testament under the laws of Moses, and in contrast to the law of love of Christ. You can take yourself from Romans seven onwards if you want to dig into that study. Um, and I don't want to take the time tonight because first of all, most of you have been through that, and, for, and secondly, if you haven't, you should do that with more leisurely. Romans 7 is law school. For you haven't been to law school, you should go into Romans 7 on. Book, take, take the book of Romans and master it and then come back next Monday and we'll go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, these, these verses are the watchman passages. There's a couple of things here. If you're interested in, in, in discovering what a watchman is, and this is for your notes, we won't take the time tonight, Second Samuel 18, verses 24 through 27, and Second Kings chapter 9, verses 17 through 20, describe the role of a watchman. You can make those notes if you want, uh, 2 Samuel 18 and, and 2 Kings 9. But the main issue of a watchman was not to deliver results, but to give warning. Okay? In other words, what you were to do is warn them of whatever. What they do with it is not your responsibility. If you were on the gates of the city and the enemy comes, you yell, give warning. You've done it's not your job to defend the city. Your job is to tell those whose job it is to defend the city. Right? So now, the watchman, the role of the watchman is an information role. And we should remember that, too. It's not your objective to save souls. That's the Holy Spirit. That's his job. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that uh, we should try to remember. God, what's our job? To be a witness. Now, there's a parallel chapter to this one in Ezekiel. We get to chapter 33, the first 20 verses. They're very parallel to this. And it's a suspect, if you remember Paul in Acts 18 and 20, both Paul probably had this chapter in mind as he gets into some of these issues. There's one other thing that I'd like to share with you that um, strikes me about Ezekiel's passage here. If we look at Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, uh, Habakkuk in chapter 2, Jeremiah in chapter 6, and Isaiah in chapter 56, there are, you quickly get the perception that Habakkuk, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, for example, saw in their horizon and in their, in, in their mission a national or corporate purpose. They were to expect a reaction on the part of the nation. Interesting here, Ezekiel's call is individual. Now, the thing that pops into my mind when I was doing some background on this was the letter to Laodicea in the seven letters of seven churches. In all the seven letters, in six of the seven letters, 
there is a call. The church has given its report card, Jesus Christ in his seven letters. In each church says something good and something bad. This is what you've done right. This is what you've done wrong. And if you straighten this out, I will give you this particular thing and so forth. When he gets to Laodicea, in the place in the letter, structurally, where there is the call to the church, there is no call to the church. Instead, he says in verse 20 of Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. Now, that's a, that little verse, verse 20 of Revelation 3, is a tremendous verse used by many evangelists as a personal call. But where it sits in context, it's a scathing indictment of the Laodicean church because structurally in the letter, in all the other letters, that's where there was a promise to the whole church. And in the Laodicea letter, there's a promise only to the individual. The, the tone that you get across is the church is dead. However, any one that happens to be in there, if you hear my voice, etc. You with me? Now, it's interesting to see uh, here in Ezekiel, the challenge he's got is individual. That, again, reinforces this concept that what God said earlier is that uh, he's not going to, the nation will not repent, even despite his preaching and all the things we're going to go through. They are going to stay in idolatry and thus go into uh, further judgment with Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and so forth. And we'll get into that shortly. Um, to continue here with uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. Now, incidentally, this hand of the Lord, you know, it's easy as we read these things to get used to the biblical idiom and not really... What really he, what's intended to come across here is he was gripped by the hand of God. The hand of the Lord was up on me like, gee, I was moved to write. No, he was gripped by the hand of God. I mean, it's a more vivid thing. The hand of the Lord was upon uh, there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord stood there like the glory which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered into me. Interesting phrase for the Old Testament. Those of you that do studies of the Holy Spirit, uh, I call your attention to verse 24. It's kind of interesting. The epe and all that uh, is Greek. But here we're in the Hebrew. Anyway, the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, spoke with me and said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thine house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put cords upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. And I will make thy tongue cling to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be to them a reprover. For they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear for they are a rebellious house. How interesting it is, is that he starts his ministry in silence. Who else started his ministry in silence? How about Saul, Damascus, and so forth? That's your study of silence. You can see, look at the other ministries that started in silence in preparation. In any case, here it's forcibly, uh, he's, he's uh, bound, but he's home, he's bound. He's, uh, in effect, struck dumb, except when the Lord uh, elects to uh, speak through him. Interesting chapter 3. I don't want to do short shrift on chapter 3, but I, I uh, think we're going to have some particular challenges in chapter 4. Let's, um, let's jump into chapter 4. Before we do that, I guess this is probably... i got somewhere in here I want to remind you or re-review the fall of the nation. It's important both for the context of Ezekiel and also to, to get at a couple of subtleties for you to have a historical perspective of the book. The great event in Israel's history in a historical perspective that around which many things swing is the so-called Babylonian captivity that we're obviously right in the middle of the book of Ezekiel. As you know, uh, the, the, the nation was called, really starts, I guess, if you want to look at it that way, with the 12 tribes of, of Jacob. Um, the whole book of Genesis, of course, is a call of a family from Abraham on. When you get to Jacob and his 12 sons, you then have the nation, in effect, the 12 tribes. And uh, it really has its birth out of Egypt. Many times uh, each, uh, Israel is spoken of as born out of Egypt. And um, uh, we have the wilderness wanderings that brought into the land under Joshua. They have the theocracy for a while, the period of the judges. Then, of course, we have the uh, kingdom start uh, initially under Saul, then, of course, under David. Uh, after that, uh, and then, of course, his son Solomon, and after that we have the Civil War, where the nation is divided. 
Under the reign of the succeeding kings, from David on to the captivity, we have ups and downs, mostly downs, now, in the two, the two houses, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, kingdom, king after king after king, flirts with idolatry. And we find them uh, turning their back on their traditions and on their insights that was given to them uh, by the God that delivered them from Egypt. And they turn to various forms of idolatry, heathen forms of worship. And uh, from time to time there's a judgment, and then there'll be uh, from time to time a king that will have a uh, revival, but then successors, it, it goes to worse. Till finally, uh, God, uh, uh, after warning them through the prophets, sends them into captivity. First, the northern kingdom, the so-called house of Israel, is conquered by the Assyrians. Uh, they fall in the fall of Samaria and so forth. Some years later, even Judah, and that's what we're dealing with here, falls to, in this case, to the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonian captivity is a very, very main event in the history. And it has a lot to do with you and I in ways that I want to try to point out to you tonight. If we're trying to find out what time it is in God's plan, you need to look at Israel. As you know, after the Babylonian captivity, they went back to the land, to their own land. They were released ultimately, and we'll come to that in a minute. But um, And then, as you all know from the study of Daniel and other books, that uh, after the Babylonians came the, the Medes and the Persians. And in fact, they were the ones that freed them and let them go home. Then came the Greeks. Under the Greeks came a universal world language that uh, Alexander enforced which led to the Septuagint version. After the Greeks were conquered by the Romans, we, of course, have set the stage for the New Testament period. From uh, the Romans on, they're dispersed. The fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Uh, uh, scatters them for virtually 1,900 years. For 1,900 years, scholars argued about certain passages in the Bible because the Bible predicted that they are to be regathered in the land and that the throne of David will eventually be reset up again. And many Bible scholars said that's figurative, can't be literal, because Israel's not in the land, and so forth. And you have all kinds of theological debates going on for centuries. Those debates, of course, should have ended on May 14th of 1948, when Ben-Gurion, using the authority of the Book of Ezekiel and others, named the new state, the new Jewish homeland, Israel, using a biblical authority to do so. And May 14th of 1948, the nation is reborn. Isaiah said in chapter 11 that when I regather them the second time, they'll never again be uprooted out of the land. Well, the first time he regathered them was after Babylon. We're going to read about that. When's the second time? In 1948. Most of us that were aware of that from 48 onwards get sensitive to the fact that uh, Jerusalem was not part of Israel. Until June of 1967, as a result of the Six-Day War, Jerusalem is again the flag of David. And we're reminded that when Jesus, the week he was crucified, he wept over Jerusalem, predicting its destruction, saying that it would be in Gentile hands until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When did the times of the Gentiles start? With Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. When did the times of the Gentiles finish? Not in 67, but rather with the Antichrist is set up. But the point is, we know that time is near because uh, our Lord pointed out that when the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Jerusalem would no longer be under Gentile hands. And interestingly enough, as of June of 1967 onwards, we have the Star of David flying over Israel. One reason it's such an incredible opportunity for all of us alive today to go visit Israel is that all these things will become more real, more tangible to you, and it makes reading the daily paper more relevant from a biblical perspective. Now, for reasons that would become clearer tonight, I would like to pause in our review of Ezekiel and do a little more historical background, but I don't believe I really went into that much detail with you last time. I'd like to describe in a little more detail this whole business of the, ca the Babylonian captivity. The first thing you should know, realize, is that the captivity, the so-called Babylonian captivity, was extensively prophesied in advance, principally by both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah did it in chapter 39, verses 5 through 7, but I'm going to take, for our preview, I'd like you to turn with me to Jeremiah, chapter 25. I'm taking Jeremiah because he's a con somewhat a contemporary, slightly ahead of Ezekiel. But I'd like you to notice Jeremiah, chapter 25, and I'm going to read verses oh, 8 through 12. In Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, verse 8 of hosts, Because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, 
and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all the nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and a horror. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon how long? Seventy years. In verse 12, it shall come to pass when the seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. Two prophecies, that they'd be slaves of Babylon for seventy years, and then after that, Babylonian would be perpetually destroyed. Is that prophecy fulfilled? How many of you know a Babylonian? Big debate. We'll get to the question, you know, if you're, when we get a revelation, will Babylon ever be rebuilt is a big, big issue. Jeremiah 27, 6, 8, and Jeremiah 29, 10 are other uh, examples of, of the prophecies. Now, in Isaiah 39, 5 to 7. Let me now, having said that, um, well, let me also point out that when we would remind you, when we study the book of Daniel, Daniel was reading Jeremiah, and from it knew that they would be slaves 70 years. Bear in mind, Daniel is a young teenager at the time Ezekiel's writing, but it's in his older age, some 67 years probably after the deportation, that Daniel is understands from Jeremiah, the book we just read, that uh, the tw 70 years are about over, and that's when he goes into prayer in chapter 9 and gets the famous 70-week vision and so forth. So um, I'd like to point out to you that the Babylonian captivity actually took place in three sieges. You're going to hear about the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, the second siege, and the third siege. And it'll be useful for us tonight to have those in perspective. About 606 B.C., Nabopolassar is actually the king of Babylon. He sets up the, the uh, and he has a crown prince, his son, Nebuchadnezzar, who is, uh, runs the army. And in 606 B.C., Pharaoh Necho of Egypt was defeated on the west bank of the Euphrates at the famous Battle of Karshemesh. And there's background on this in Jeremiah chapter 46, first six verses, for those of you who want to dig into it. At that point, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, the, was then the known... Uh, Thus made Babylon, by that conquest, that was their major enemy, and by subduing the Egyptians, that made Babylonian more powerful than anyone in that area. He pursues Pharaoh Necho to Egypt, and then from there rules Egypt. About 605 B.C., on his way home, he lays siege to Jerusalem. Jehoiakim, not Jehoiachin, but Jehoiakim, is captured, fettered. This is in Second Chronicles 36, for those of you who want to dig into it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, 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 conquers the king. And he puts in a vassal king, or actually Jehoiakim is released and made as a... Well, back up. He puts the king in fetters of brass, gets a message that his father died back in Babylon. So he's now not just ruler of the army, he is king of Babylon. So he releases Jehoiakim as a vassal king. He plunders the temple, goes and, and takes all the gold and stuff. And he also took a set of captives, the trained artisans... Among these, he took the most promising teenagers. And that's where Daniel and his three friends go, to, and they're, they're educated at court. What he does is he puts them in, it was his style to pick people from his captives that were the most promising and try to pick the best from their culture. He'd also trained those young men in the Babylonian ways, so he'd have a basis, very enlightened guy in terms of the way he would exploit his conquest. But in any case, that's the first siege of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, after about a couple of years, Jehoiakim rebels. And what Nebuchadnezzar does, he has the Chaldeans, the Syrians, the Moabites, the Ammonites, were sent to destroy Judah. This is in 2 Kings 24. Uh, four. There's a five-year battle that goes on. Jehoiakim dies in Jeremiah 22, verse 17 through 19. His son, known as Jehoiachin, that's the one about Ezekiel, also had, goes by the name of Jeconiah. Uh, he reigns uh, for about three months, but by then the... Uh, uh, siege is over, and uh, well, it's actually by 598. Nebuchadnezzar siege uh, succeeds. They carry away Jehoiachin, Chin, 10,000 captives, 1,000 smiths, according to Second Kings 24. And his uncle, Zedekiah, is placed on as king. Now, it's interesting that Ezekiel never speaks of Zedekiah. Some people never really regard him as a legitimate heir. But in any case, Zedekiah is put on as a king. And uh, everything's fine for a while. Some years later, actually about 587 B.C., there's another rebellion. Zedekiah has another rebellion. There's another siege, a third siege. Had a first siege, departed. I came on board. 
Second seed, Jehoiakim Kim dies. Jehoiakim Chin is finally put down. And Zedekiah put on. Then Zedekiah rebels. And in the third siege, Jerusalem is leveled. The city and the temple are destroyed. And uh, this is in 2 Kings 24 and 25 and so forth. Incidentally, just as an aside, we'll cover this later in Ezekiel, but uh, there's an interesting thing. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel are writing about the time of the third siege. Ezekiel is writing from being captive, and apparently Jeremiah is not. Jeremiah, in chapter 32, 5, points out, Jeremiah talks to Zedekiah and is trying to warn him that he shouldn't rebel, that even though Nebuchadnezzar is a Gentile king, the Lord has appointed him to be uh, a ruler. And that uh, he pointed out that uh, Jeremiah tells him that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is going to lead you, Zedekiah, to Babylon. Ezekiel, in chapter 12, verse 13, points out that Zedekiah would never see Babylon. And uh, Josephus tells us that Zedekiah refused to believe either one of them. He just made fun of them, said, you guys can't agree with each other. Here's, you know, Ezekiel says one thing, and Ezekiel says he'll never see it. Jeremiah says that he's going to be led to Babylon in chains. What's interesting for us to do, I can't resist this, turn to 2 Kings 25, and you get a lesson in prophecy. The lesson is to read the small print. Uh, 2 Kings 25 describes what happens in the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, verse 6. Just describe all that whole chapter is where uh, Nebuchadnezzar came to pass. It opens up the ninth year of his reign, the tenth month, and the tenth day of the month. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and came he and all his host against Jerusalem and so forth. And the city was broken up. And so we get down to verse 6. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah and pronounced sentence upon him. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in fetters of bronze and carried him to Babylon. Last thing he saw was the sun slain. Then they put him, blinded him, and carried him off to Babylon. Now, when you go back and read Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and you see this apparent contradiction, that uh, where Jeremiah pointed out that he was going to be led off to Babylon in chains, he was. Ezekiel said, but that he would never see Babylon. He didn't. Okay, gives you the creeps. Doesn't it? <laughs> now, the point that I want to get at is that um, we have three sieges of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem. The first siege of Jerusalem, first group of captives, rebellion. Second siege, more captives, vassal king. Third siege, Nebuchadnezzar has enough of this. He sends his troops to not only take the city, but he levels it and takes everybody's slaves. Third siege. Chuck will continue this study on the following tape in this series.